Hey everybody, my name is Daryl Barrett. I'm back with Michael Todd. This is the second installment of our X-Gen Vision series, and we're going to be talking about short fur, and we've got a monkey. We have a monkey. So this monkey has been set up using groomable splines. A lot of that work's already been done, and if we go ahead and we turn on the display of those groomable splines, you can see that we get a pretty good representation of what's going on, but I actually like to display it with cards versus lines. What's the difference between cards and lines? Uh, cards actually shows the, the, the set width, and using lines, uh, if you're painting width, you might not, you don't get to see the value that you're painting. Okay. So uh, you might paint the, away the primitives, because you can set the width to zero and paint away the width uh, of the primitives, and then they might not show up in a render, and you might not know why. But then if you switch to cards, you can see that the, the, the value is So it set. just gives you a little bit more feedback. It's, it's a yeah, slightly it's, it's a way to avoid it. getting into a situation where you, you get a result that you weren't expecting. Right on. So we're going to go with cards. Yeah. I like them. Cool. So the next thing that I want to ask about is, and this is something that's you know, a little unclear, a little vague. When you're using groomable splines, where, what, do you, what are you looking for in the density? Do you want low density and then you let the instant primitives fill in? Do you want to paint with high density? No. What's the approach here? What's uh, the best I, practice? I, I always set the density of the groomable splines to be the, the final uh, representative density of the HGM look that you, you're going for. Okay. Because then you get the control over all the primitives because each the brushes can control every primitive. And rather than uh, letting XGen do some interpolation after the fact, you can actually control the, the look directly on the primitives and just, you can use that rather than let uh, instancing take care of that for you after the fact. And you can always reduce density in the final render uh, splines or you can even add density in the final render splines if you want to. But okay. I, I'd set it around where you want it to be. All right, cool. So I, I want this to be higher than, than 30. So if I put this up to something like 60 and I you know hit go, uh, what's happened? My monkey, uh, well, it's, I it's, messed it up. I'm it, in trouble. Uh, every, you know, we get a lot of calls about this and saying, I call like, you about this. Yes, you do. He says, Why has it all gone wrong? What the hell have I done? Oh, I hosed. And it's not that bad. You just go back in and you sort of import grooming. And uh, as long as you've done a preview prior to you know, you know, this screw up, you will get the, the, the files back because they've been baked out to disk. Okay, so it's you don't even have to save. It's the actual no. preview, the preview of the generation. The, the preview X bakes out the, the PTEX files to, to disk. So now we have denser count, and it looks like it's taken into account all those directional yeah. maps, those length maps, things like that. So when I'm working, do I always, if I you know, want to change density or change something, do I always have to go back and reload my maps, or do I have other options? No, linear is there for the default setup because it gives you a better result when okay. you're setting up the description in the first place. Because using nearest.interp, we tried doing uh, nearest.interp as the default, but it would give bad results. It would give uh, artifacting in the, the directionality of the, the primitives off the surface. So we went with linear for the default setup option. Okay. Uh, when, once you started using the grooming tools, uh, it's better to switch to nearest or interp. So any changes to density or uh, width or anything like that won't actually blow away the directionality or the, the, the maps that you've painted. So I've got, I've got it set to 70 nearest, hit go. I have more density in there now. It didn't blow my work. Right. So that's pretty cool. So let's talk about a couple of the brushes because some of these I actually really, you know, like things like length, breadth, width, pretty pretty straightforward. But the elevation brush, really really cool. And the masking brushes actually have a lot of lot of cool functionality inside of them. So I want to paint a region where I want to isolate where I'm going to be working using this masking brush, which is you know it's not too hard to do. Just kind of paint paint around that area right there. And then I want to use that elevation brush to start to lift up those instance those 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 uh, groomable splines. So when I bring up the elevation brush here, what do these different parameters mean? Uh, the degrees is the uh, degrees it's going to apply per stroke. Okay. And the goal angle is the final goal angle of the primitives relative to the surface that they're growing from. So it evaluates the, uh, the direction that the primitives are growing from the surface. And once you've set a goal angle, and once it reaches that angle, uh, the primitives won't go past that angle. They'll just reach uh, the value of 84 and they will stay there once they've reached that value. All right, cool. So I kind of brush those guys up. Now, here's something that I think is really cool. When you have this masking set up, you can actually use the flipping brushes, and it's going to flip and respect the masking. So it's not going to flip the whole body. It's only no. going to flip the area that's been actually you know, So you might work on one side, of the, one side of the mesh and get the look you like, and then you just flip that with or the Or just mask fix brush. a hand, and you don't want to flip the middle line of the face if yeah. you had some asymmetry in the face or something like Somet that. Because sometimes if you've got some randomization uh, across the middle, if you flip everything across the middle, you might see right some uh, artifacting down the center line. Very, so very you, cool. You can, you can avoid that with a mask. Cool, cool. So we're going to go ahead and just clear that guy out. So the next thing that we want to do is just go ahead and turn on our preview of our of our monkey here and 
you know, it looks pretty good with all the painting work done, but is this where you stop when you're doing short fur, or do you normally add on more? What do you, what, uh, what's your you approach? Can, you, can get quite, you can get all the way with the grooming tools, but sometimes you might want to add more variation or more con uh, uh, look development on top of the grooming uh, brushes. So from there, you could go and add more modifiers or more controls via expressions in conjunction with modifiers or maps. So we'll add a clump modifier on here. We need to generate some maps for this guy, so we'll say set up maps, and you know we can set that density down maybe a little bit lower, something like that. Hit the generate button one more time to see what. Well, that's not quite right. Let's go 0.8. No, I think it needs uh, need to be higher than that actually. What do you What do you think? What do you think? I'll go value? back up to 20, I think, because he uh, remembers the settings from the last oh, uh, run. Okay, 20. Okay, that looks pretty good. Okay. I like lower 15. No, I'm good. We're going to argue about this. No, right, fine. No, 20's good. 20. 15's good. All right, so we'll go ahead and we'll save that guy out. We save those maps out. We generate our preview, and now we're going to have a monkey that's got some clumping on him, so he's going to, he's going to look wet. He's going to, look he's, wet. Like, he's going to have a bath. He's, going to, he's, he's, had a, he's, had a, he's had a serious bath there, but that looks pretty cool. So we could also use you know, things like those scene length mapping, all, that, all those tricks that we were doing before, we could do on this also, yeah, right? Definitely. Uh, you can use the scene length, which is the final calculated length of the primitive, as a multiplier on a parameter, say, the clumping effect or a noise effect. So if you wanted to only really clump the longer hairs, you could add that dollar C length, and it will apply more clumping to the longer hairs than to the shorter hairs. Dollar C length, so we'll just add that guy in there and just hit accept, and then we'll preview that out one more time, so the longer hairs should, should get more of the clumping. It will get more clumping, short, because more that, clumping than the that will push hairs. it past one, so you might want to drop the Oh, but uh, that yeah. shows that scene length mapping going into a full effect. That adds more effect. <laughs> I, I like it. That's pretty cool. So those are just a few examples of how we can use. Okay. <laughs> I don't. Come on. <laughs> no. he's, he's an art director no, also. He's not, just, he's not just product yeah, I'm designer. Gonna, I'm gonna ask all right, all right. Fine, now. fine, fine, fine. Let's, let's go back. We'll edit it. We won't leave it all jacked up like that. We'll put That's point better. three. Yeah. Okay. We'll hit accept one more time. We'll regenerate that preview and we'll make Mr. Todd happy. Thank you. He doesn't, he doesn't like it when I abuse his monkey. No, leave my monkey alone. Leave it alone. There, there you go. Very much better. Oh, look at that. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. All right, so those are just a few examples of how we can do uh, some grooming work using groomable splines. We're going to be checking out some more short hair workflows in uh, the next section. Okay. So in this next example, we're going to be looking at how we can add some dynamic movement to a short hair system or a fur system. So we've got some groomable splines growing out of a plane here. We've got a polygon object just moving across that guy and we want to have some level of interaction when that sphere moves across this, this uh, grimmable spline surface. We want to make those guys interact with each other. So how do we, how do, we do that with XGen? Uh, you would add uh, an NMY modifier and use that to procedurally generate a collision system, uh, a dynamic system, uh, and you can control how many uh, curves you get in that system, and it will actually build them all for you based on the settings that you give it when you generate the, the system itself. Okay, and cool. then you can use those curves to drive the deformation of the X-Gen primitives based on the collision that you set up in the N-Hair system. Awesome, and there's a lot of control in here, so you can mask out which curves are going to get affected by that N-Hair system. You can adjust how much of that N-Hair system is going to affect those curves down the length of the curve based with this ramp uh, magnified yeah. scale that goes from the root to the tip. So a lot of the similar controls that we've seen in other parts of X-Gen also are inside of this, this um, anim wire modifier tool. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like an animated clump uh, deformation system. And you can also paint out a mask area, so if you, you know, maybe you were doing something that had uh, grass or something like that, and you had a character that was going to walk through the grass, you didn't want to generate in hair curves across your whole terrain, you want to have this isolated to the area of the path that the character is going to follow, yeah. you could paint a mask file to, to have it only grow those in hair curves yeah. in, that, in that region. So for this example, we're going to leave our default value density of one. That's going to give us a few random in hair curves that this sphere will have the ability to go in there and push, push away. So we'll just hit create button. It's going to go through and generate our curves for us. So now we can do our preview wires, and you can see that is essentially where that, that hair system is going to be, right? Yeah, they, each one of those represents where a curve is going to be generated because it will go through and generate a curve from each primitive. So we'll go and we'll ask um, XGen to generate that hair system for us automatically. And again, this is going to be an in-hair system. So it's going to give us a few things when we create these dynamic curves. We're going to tell it to snap those curves to that piece of geometry. So if this was an animating character, those would go along for the ride of that. It would pick up its movement. It would add nice secondary animation. In this example, it's just going to pick up the movement of the uh, sphere passing over it and push them away. But you, know, you do attach it to the surface in almost every example. Yeah. You do so, want it to follow along usually. Otherwise, they might fall through the surface as well. So. All right, so we'll go ahead and we'll apply that. 
So it, it actually is, it's quite a few curves there. Yeah, it's quite a few. And if we look at our outliner, what, what Maya has done is it's gone ahead and it's given us the follicle curves. Those are the original curves. And it's also given us the output curves, which are the dynamic moving curves. So we're going to hide those follicle curves. And the next thing that we want to do is we want to take these output curves. And you have to actually select the curves. You can't select the group, unfortunately. And we're going to link those guys into our XGen system. So, so we're just going to say attach. attach the selected curves to our XGen. So as soon as we do that, we now have. XGen will now deform based on the collision. We, have, we haven't set up a, uh, a collision object. So yeah. we've got to grab this sphere and jump over to the FX menu, go to end cloth, and create a passive object from that. So now if we play this back, and I'm not going to turn the XGen preview on. Let's make sure auto preview is turned off. We just want to see what the, the dynamics look like here. So as this object kind of passes over here, those curves get pushed away. I'm going to change a few of the parameters on those. I want those curves to be a little bit stiffer. I want them to kind of bounce up a little bit um, quicker. So we'll just use some of the hair system attributes to, to do that. Like if we just give it a little bit of start curve of track, something like 0.1, and maybe if we give it a little bit of dampening there, Something like 0.4. It's and going the to have stiffness or the bend resistance, maybe. Yeah, we could, we could, we could definitely. Yeah. You could go crazy. You could, you could you add. You spend all day doing that. You could, you could spend all day moving these sliders, making that hair system look perfect. For this example, I think I've done a good job. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with that. I'm gonna go with I've done a good job there. That's fine. So let's go ahead and do a preview of this and see what it looks like. Let's generate that XGen system and have it do that, and nothing happened. <laughs> Did they, uh, oh, you have to go back to frame one. Ah. Uh, All right, so let's go ahead. Preview that. Let's yeah. go ahead and preview that. And then let's play back. So you've got to give it a kick, apparently. apparently you haven't got like auto preview. There you go. There you go. So you'll notice that as these guys kind of move through here, you can see each one of those in hair systems is grabbing a group of uh, those instance primitives and kind of pulling them along for the ride. It's kind of like, uh, the, similar, to the, similar to the clumping system. So each guide, each uh, wire effectively has got a group of primitives associated with it and it will deform those uh, primitives based on the deformation of the curve. Okay. So you can up the interpolation on that so it would actually blend between the, the neighboring uh, primitives regions as well. So we put it to 0.5, it starts to smooth that effect out. Yep. And you, know, you can obviously put that up to something like one if you wanted to and it's going to smooth it out even a little bit more. So that's happening, essentially, you know, the collisions are, are they're kind of happening at a coarse level right now. They're yeah. happening at the in hair level. So if I really wanted this sphere to actually push away each instance primitive, we also have the ability to do that with a collision modifier, yeah. right? Uh, so yeah, for that, before you add that, you might want to turn the effect collisions on and then add a collision modifier. Okay, so we'll jump in here and we'll add in a collision modifier. So the collision modifier is going to look, because it's happening, Basically at render time, right? Uh, at the generation time. So it looks at the, uh, well, you give it a, a cache object based on the sphere. So you, you know, cache that out as an alembic cache. And then it will read that cache and it will uh, look to the primitives. And any primitive that is uh, intersecting or colliding with that primitive will get pushed out of the way of the primitive, uh, of, of the sphere. So, so the a first primitive collision. The first thing we need to do is get that collision mesh saved off the disk so that yeah. XGen has something to work with. Yeah. So we'll jump up to the cache. We'll say Alembic, and we'll export selection as an Alembic cache. So export selection to Alembic. And I'll just overwrite the one that we already exported out. So we'll just say yes to that guy. It's going to run through the process, caching that guy out off the disk. So now we can go back and load that cache file in, which I believe is living here and here. It should be, if you go and click on that, it should be in that list. There you go. So we've got that cache file loaded in. So now if we just kind of scrub forward in time here, or let our animation play back in time, and generate the preview, if we hide this sphere, you'll see that each instanced primitive is being pushed away. And you have different control over here for how it's going to deal with resolving that, right? So yeah, flexible is you know, it'll deform the primitives. Uh, stiff actually rotates the primitive away from the collider at the base, and then wire flex is based on it's like deformation based on the uh, the uh, anim wire modifier. So it's actually pushing them away based on the the maps and the controls that is set in the anim wire modifier as well. 
and the wire stiff is similar to that, and it will rotate them at the, from the base. In very, the very cool. So we have sort of a coarse control happening at the, at the dynamic level, and then at sort of a per-primitive level, yeah. we're using the collision modifier to just make sure each individual strand or each individual instance piece of geometry. Yeah, so if it was like a close-up of a, like somebody's hand going through the hair, you could have a collision object of the hand, and the, each finger would like push each primitive out of the way so the, the primitives wouldn't go through the fingers or the hands. Super cool. I love that. Well, thanks for sharing that with us. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you. So the next one we're going to look at is just, it's crazy, right? So we're going to, we're going to, we're going to load that one up, and uh, we'll be back in two seconds. All right, so this last example is actually one that Michael um, just surprised me with, and it's uh, Michael Magnus. It's crazy. So what we've got going on here is we've got a deforming piece of geometry. It's got some short, some short fur on it, and it's actually using the tilt command or attribute to adjust the primitives, and it's using it's referencing normals or something so that they don't pass through each other. So as, as it kind of moves through this shape here, if you look on the inside, these guys are actually tilting away from the surface. I mean, it's, the it's surface. using the, uh, uh, when you bind XGen to uh, an object, it actually builds a PREF, and that actually also stores uh, normal information. So you could actually, uh, the normal uh, angles for the, uh, the object that you're binding XGen to uh, can be used in relation to the current normals if you're deforming it. So you can actually subtract one from the other to drive uh, a parameter such as the tilt. So when the object is actually like compressing in on itself, you can use the difference between the the reference normal and the the current normal to actually control how the primitives are angled from the surface so they don't actually crash through the, the surface and stick out on the other side or do something weird. So just that. by getting that delta and, and referencing that in this expression, yeah. you're able to make those yeah, instances uh, not pass through the surface. Yeah, because uh, SE expression can actually, you know, it can uh, evaluate anything you know, given on the object that the action is bound to. It can evaluate the current point in space, the normal, the PREF or displacement or anything you can give it that it's on the object itself, XGen uh, and SA expression can actually use that information to drive parameters in the, awesome. on the primitives. Itself. So it's just a simple, you know, four lines of expression code using the stuff that's built in, yeah. doing something really cool. Yeah, I, I did that because somebody asked me if it was possible to control, use the surface normals to control uh, primitives so they don't crash through each other, and uh, I came up with this example for them. Love it. Very, very cool. All right, so we're going to call it a wrap for this, uh, for this session. Thanks for taking the time to check out some 